Hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? I already see some people are in here. Cheers, Coz, Ren. How are you guys? <laughs> Coz, I think you're you're new to the stream. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining. How's everybody's uh, week been so far? It feels good to be streaming back on a Wednesday because I know we usually stream like twice, two to three times a week. Um, is Khalil in time? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No Khalil time or island time today. We we are we are punctual. <laughs> yeah, David. I feel like it's been a minute. I haven't seen you too much in the server. Would love to see you back in there. Hey, Darulu. Hey, Victor. Victor, appreciate you um, showing some love to Namiria's write-up. Really appreciate that. Both of y'all's week have been good. Good. Got to hear. Yeah, my week's been pretty good as well. Um, just been, like, making a lot of music, honestly, and just working a lot. So, yeah, feeling great. Victor, are you going to participate in the uh, challenge this week? And I guess that goes to everyone. Cheers, Coz, Ren, David, Derulo. Are you guys in the, the challenge as well? Yeah, the the write-up. Basically, what we post on um, Instagram and uh, Twitter. We do like a small write-up after we interview people. We interviewed Namiria like a while back for her art, and uh, we did a write-up for her. So for the people who don't know, which I'm assuming you should know by the title, today we'll be uh, live with a professional artist. So in a little bit, a couple minutes, we'll bring him on and excited for you guys to get some advice from him. Um, you know, this is something that we really enjoy doing, bringing on artists that we believe can help you and that you guys can get advice from because um, that's what really the garden is about, is about helping you all as much as we can. So. Uh, you guys seem to always really enjoy it and go back and watch these videos even after it goes live. So, yeah, we really, really appreciate that. Hey, Graphical, how are you? Hey, Danny. Um, so, Amplify was a banger. Yeah, hey, I'm glad you like that song. Really, it's doing pretty well. Like, the drop has been pretty well, too. Um, you've been making some games. Nice, Ren. You're working on the, the challenge right now. Cheers. Um, and I will participate on the second one this month. Okay, cool. You have made a submission. You commented on it. Oh, did I really? Did I really? Okay. Won't be able to be here for the stream, though. Yeah, all good. All good. You're talking about this Friday when we do it, the stream? I didn't come up with the best idea for the context. My week's been full of sick, so inspiration is squat. Yeah, all good. Um, we'll have, like I was saying before, even after this week, we'll have another two weeks of um, a challenge as well. So no worries at all about that. So I think after this next spooky challenge, we will do probably like a fall challenge. Um, but we'll have you guys vote on that as well. So you guys can choose what you would like the challenge to be. Yeah, all good, Ren, no worries. Am I quieter than normal? Let me turn it up some. Is that better for you all? That probably is a lot better. It's probably because also I have this like Chaotica ball on as well, which I just like. I use it when I record anyway, so um, it just makes it sound like more crisp and no outside noise. So I probably just have to turn it up a little bit more. Yeah, let me know how's the before we start. Let me know if the music's the music's the music uh, is at a good level. Um, my volume of my voice. Yeah, let me know better. OK, awesome. In that case, let's get started then. Um, 
to the stream, I would like to welcome Jeff. Uh, he's an amazing and unique uh, artist that I think you guys will learn a lot from and be inspired by. Uh, so yeah, welcome to the stream. Hey, Khalil. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting and thanks to the garden mm -hmm. for, for having me on this stream. Uh, I'm kind of new to the the streaming live type thing, so it's it's exciting to be here. Yeah, well, well, thank you once again, and yeah, streaming and just technology nowadays are are going at a, a very exponential pace. So it, it's good that to to hop on it, you know. Um, and we're really really excited to to have you on because I think one big thing is we bring on like you know like a lot of different painters, some digital artists as well, but there's not a lot of people like you. Um, that have a very unique set of skills that are still able to um, execute at a high level. And I think just from people, maybe even if they're, because there's probably like not too many type of artists like you in the garden, but I feel like no matter what, they might be able to take like a different perspective um, when it comes to their creation or just like be able to get advice that maybe they wouldn't have heard from someone else. Um, and I feel like I'm being like really mysterious right now talking about your <laughs> art. Uh, so maybe this is a good time for you to introduce yourself, uh, say who you are, how you got into art and maybe your type of art too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, my name is Jeff and I am a bottle cap artist. I also work with wine corks too. Um, so yeah, I, I basically take discarded bottle caps and I, I flatten them and I create portraits out of them. Um, I love music. Uh, music has been a huge part of my life. So to create influential musicians with my style is something that I really like doing right now. Uh, I'm sure I will branch off and start doing other things as well. But for the time being, I'm having a lot of fun just, you know, creating portraits of, of the musicians that have been influential to me and to others. Um, how I got into it. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, that's a good story. I literally uh, fell into it. Uh, I was a bartender back. Uh, we're going on 16 years ago now, uh, my early 20s. And um, I just every beer I opened, every beer bottle I opened, you know, we'd throw out the bottle caps. Like it's a pretty mm -hmm. standard thing to do at any bar, restaurant. And uh, I just noticed how cool all the caps were. They're, they're all different colors. They have cool logos on them. There's just like such a big variety. So I, um, I just decided to keep them and I, I stashed them away at work. Like no one was gonna be upset about that. Like it's just trash. So, <laughs> you know, no, no big deal there, right? Yeah. So I saved him for a good year and I had like a ton at my place. And yeah, I just looked at this like huge stash of caps that I had. I probably had like, if I had to guess, like at least like 10 or 15,000 caps, um, just like tucked away in my closet, mm -hmm. a couple boxes full, right? And so I was like, okay, like Jeff, you've, you've saved these caps for a year now. You gotta either do something with them or throw them out. And I didn't want to throw them out. I saved them already, right? So I was like, okay, like let's let's try and figure out what to do, Jeff. Um, and so I I'm a big Beatles fan. They're probably one of my like they were like my first like intro into like you know that kind of like psychedelic rock and roll like early '60s, mid '60s into the '70s type music. And that was like my first foray into my love of music. So. Um, I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll um, try and create one of the Beatles. John Lennon is, you know, very iconic, amazing songwriter. So I'm going to try and uh, just create John Lennon's face out of bottle caps. And I just, I don't know how I'm going to go about this, but I know it has to be some sort of mosaic. You know, they're all little pixels in a way, right? So how can I place them? Um, I first tried out the technique where you're just laying one right next to the other, you know, I didn't flatten them or anything. And I was like, ah, like this piece is going to have to be massive if I want to get the definition that I'm looking for. So I decided to flatten a bunch of them and uh, try layering them. So um, that was that was like a really good first learning process. Like this whole this whole thing was trial and error, literally. Um, 
as far as the design goes, I, I've always been kind of like a sketch guy. Like in class, I was always doodling. I, I took art in grade 10 and that was about it. But uh, I always been, you know, a drawer. So I, I drew out a sketch uh, of John Lennon. And then I put that, like scanned it and put it into my computer and literally used Microsoft Paint on like, you know, Windows, whatever we were at at the time, like Windows 2000 or something. I And I just like used the paint bucket to try and fill in different spots, like almost create my own paint by numbers. And so that's how I created my first design. And then I just laid it out. I did the grid system and like just drew it out onto the, uh, I just had a big piece of plywood and uh and got to work and um yeah no this this thing took me six years to make front to back um basically trial and error just figuring out what works what doesn't so yeah like flattening them was key um layering them like fish scales so that they're all overlapping it gave me the ability to you know really tighten up the the definition of, of the piece and like keep that integrity you know i can get pretty accurate now uh so that's what i was going for but it took me yeah six years front to back to get that thing done i walked away from that thing so many times uh you know i i hurt myself because i at first i was just using little nails and like hammering them in and i you know the nail would like move and it'd go into my finger or something so I was like okay maybe i should use like a, a nail gun or something and some needle nose pliers so like i'm taking the chance of injury out so it was uh it was a big process for sure yeah it, especially like when people think about you know when they first start a certain craft and almost expect overnight success immediately or for them to just be at a certain level immediately and that's why i really want you to tell this story because your first work took six years which is it's it's honestly insane because I don't see like yeah. people doing that, you know, but that's why you are successful right now. You know, it's because yeah. no matter how long it took you to do it, you finished it. And that sparked then you to be like, OK, I can do this. Let's let's continue to do them. And, you know, like I I, I really commend that. Um, and then side note before. Thanks. Um, of course, you respond. Just letting everyone know in the chat, feel free to ask questions like normal. And um, I will make sure I save them. So I ask them to Jeff and we can get those answered. Um, but one one thing someone uh, mentioned in here was it's kind of like pixel art in real life, which is very interesting because I didn't like I didn't put two and two together um, uh, until they said that. And it, it is true because it, it's like it's literally every single bottle cap until you can get what you have behind you. Um, and so someone, I guess, uh, asked, wait, how many works has he done if one took him six years? If you want to get into that. <laughs> yeah. So the first one took me six years, but my second one um, only took me, I think, about two and a half months. So a pretty good upgrade in efficiency and time. Um, by the end of that uh, first piece, that John Lennon piece, I had pretty much gotten like my bare bones type like technique down. Uh, so yeah, when I, a friend of mine was opening a bar actually, and he he knew I was working on this this John Lennon piece, and so when I actually finished it, he saw it and he was like, "Oh man, that's that's cool. Like, can I get a?" He's he's a huge Clash fan, so he asked for a Joe Strummer piece, and I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." He didn't know it took me six years to make the first piece. I was like, when are you opening that bar again? He goes, oh, I'm opening it up in about, I think it was like four months at the time. So I was like, okay, yeah, no problem. And I was like, okay, nothing like a deadline to get an artist to, you know, get a piece of work done. So that was my first ever commission. And um, yeah, so it only took me about two and a half months. And then after that, my next piece maybe only took me about a month. And now... I can get a piece like this done in a week to 10 days type thing. So, um, yeah, definitely gotten more efficient and, you know, the more time you put into anything, it's, it's any skill, you just, it takes time, mm -hmm. right? You know, you can't just sit down at the piano and a week later become like an expert and like play a concerto. Like it takes years to develop skills like that. And art is no different. So, uh, sure. yeah, it's, I think, yeah, lesson number one, advice number one, uh, if you have an idea and you, you really can like see it in your head, 
there is a way to do it. It's just you might have to take a couple different paths to reach that final destination. And you might hit a dead end here and have to go back and turn another way. But yeah, the the not giving up thing is probably the biggest number one key when you're starting out. Um, yeah, because who who's going to spend six years on a piece of artwork? And, you know, it may look good. It may look like crap, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, it just so happened that like I just stuck to it and I had a good like idea and I just had to come up with a plan from there. So, yeah, sticking with it is um, lesson number one for sure. Yeah. And and in order to get to where you are now, those six years were very, very important because you got to figure out what didn't work. And like, obviously, as you start to do it more and more, you figured out, OK, how to be more efficient how to be more safe because I don't want to hurt myself in the process. And that is all a part of it. Everyone thinks it's just like, oh, it took him six years because he didn't really know uh, how to do it properly. But it's a lot of other things that go into it as well. And I think you said it perfectly when it comes to if you have it in your head, there are ways to get there, but it just might take different paths. And I think that hits home for sure because a lot of people might have those dreams and they – it might not be going exactly how they expected to go. It might not be hitting the road exactly how they expect the road and journey to be or expect certain obstacles. Or like you said, you hit a dead end and come back and have to figure out, OK, now which direction to go. I think a lot of people deal with that. And when they first uh, face that adversity, sometimes it can be kind of discouraging. And can mm -hmm. you speak about that a little and how you're able to still stay encouraged and, um, yeah, push for the finish line, essentially? Yeah, pushing for the finish line. Yeah, that was a marathon, not a sprint, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, yeah, pushing through is, uh, I mean, I think a healthy part of it, too, is taking breaks. And when you are frustrated and you do hit those dead ends, it's totally fine to just, like, step away, take some time. Oftentimes, like I think Albert Einstein was famous for taking walks because that would just clear his mind and then an idea would pop in his head and then he'd go back to the blackboard, right? Mm -hmm. And same thing with artists, right? Like you have an idea, can't quite achieve it. Oh, how do I get the shading here? How do I, you know, make, make this look uh, a certain way, a certain style or something? you're just not getting it. I mean, you can try and push through and maybe sometimes you'll, you'll just break through that, that like just blunt force, go through it. But I think it's very healthy to take some breaks and mm -hmm. let your mind just wander. Don't even think about it. And then suddenly, you know, you'll, you'll have sometimes like I would wake up in the middle of the night and go, Oh, I think I know what I need to do. And, and then, you know, the next morning kind of thing, just like, go right into the studio and try it out. Ah, it worked. You know what I mean? So that like the brain works in mysterious ways when it comes to creativity and like synapses happen when you're not even thinking about it. Like your subconscious mind is, is a powerful thing. So to let it do its thing, I think is very important too. You can't just like always brute force solve problems. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. Take time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. And what do you think was your biggest struggle um, throughout this whole process? Like the whole thing or that first piece or just... I guess maybe it? talk about both sides, like uh, in the beginning okay. and then now where you are as an artist today. Okay, I'll start with that first piece, the beginning. Um, literally having to like invent a, a technique, a style. Um, at that time, you know, I Googled it. I, I tried to look on, well, YouTube wasn't, or what was it? I think YouTube was like a year old at that point or something when I first started. So like, I don't think I even knew about YouTube. Like I couldn't just hop on there and, you know, bottle cap artist. So like any, anytime I looked on, on, uh, on line for inspiration, it was, you know, tons of people would do those cool, like bar tops where they would put all the caps in there and put some epoxy over it or whatever, but there was nothing like portraits or anything more um, complex than those bar top things. So it was like pretty challenging to just try and invent my own technique basically. So that was, that was a big, big struggle for sure. And there were times where like I would take four months off and just not even think about it. I would tuck it away in my closet and just not even think about it. And that was, I think very healthy. So yeah, 
challenge there was just um, really trying to like come up with my own technique. And I think the style kind of followed through from just the palette that I have. I mean, caps only come in so many colors. I wasn't buying any caps. Like there's a ton of people on eBay that are selling caps, all different colors and stuff like that. But I was literally just trying to save caps from the bar that I was working at and a few, a few friends of mine, they were bartenders too. And so they would save caps for me. So it was literally like I was forced into pop art because the most dominant colors are very colorful, like bright yellows and bright reds and a lot of really bright colors. Right. So to abide by the palette that I was given um, was a challenge as well, but like it forced me to be more creative with it and, and use different shades and colors to my advantage and I really love the pop art style anyway so uh, I just went with it um, so I think in general from you know day one until today the biggest challenge um, I think the biggest struggle for me was taking that leap to go full-time mm -hmm. um, I, I literally just passed my one year anniversary as a full-time artist uh, like October 1st was like the rough date I don't know the exact yeah. congratulations date, but, by the way um, thank you yeah thanks so in retrospect like part of me is kicking myself that I should have just done this like you know 10 years ago or like eight years ago or five years ago or even you know but life is what it is and i i guess it was just a timing thing and uh and a year ago it just seemed like the right time i mean on paper maybe not i uh i had like a what was he like a nine month old uh at the time uh, well when i quit when i put my notice in at my my i had a good job and you know things were going well but when i put my notice in yeah i had an eight month old and uh you know my wife and I have a mortgage. So like on paper, maybe not the best time to do it, but we had a good conversation, my wife and I, and um, it just, you know, we, we, we had felt it would be fair to give the art a year and see how it goes. And if at the end of that year, things weren't going as planned, I could always do it in my spare time. Like I was before, you know, I would always have a job and do this nights and weekends. I was a weekend warrior with this stuff, right? So at the end of the day, if that is what it had to be, I was happy with that. She was happy with that. But uh, this year has just blown up. And so uh, I'm not I'm not going back to the day job. <laughs> I'm doing this, yeah. and, you know. For, so, for sure. um, yeah. Yeah. And, and do you think you're better for it that it didn't happen eight years ago or 10 years ago? Do you think? This uh, obviously, like someone said in here, Danny was like, "It's never a good time," which is, is so true. It's it's there's if you're waiting on that perfect moment, it's never gonna come. It's you just have to make the conscious effort and decision to decide. Okay, this is when I'm gonna do it, but it's never the perfect yeah. time. Um, and just going backpacking off of that, do you think you are better now off as an artist starting when you started compared to if you would have started years ago? I mean. We'll never know. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I like to try and think of those, you know, alternate timelines. Like, let's say I did finish that piece and I just was like, okay, I'm going for it. Like, what would life look like? Maybe it wouldn't have been so good because that, that first piece that I did and even the second and third were like, you know, I, I was happy with them at the time. But looking back, I'm like, oh, I could have changed that. I could have made this better. I could have done that. You know, like it would have been a completely different piece had I done it now. So, I mean, everything happens for a reason. And the reason that I took like basically 15 years to make that jump uh, is, is the reason it is. I don't know what it is, but like, yeah, uh, I, yeah it, it may have gone terribly if I tried to do this like eight years ago or something, right? Like maybe it would just like, you know, the timing was off and it would have just fallen flat. So the fact that I waited that long, I think, you know, it, it is what it is, but I'm glad that how it is, how it has gone for the last year is, uh, is extremely well. And I'm, I'm very fortunate and extremely grateful for it. And I'm going to just like, at the beginning of that year, like one year ago, I decided to completely dive in. So I think the lesson there is when you do end up making that choice to go, 
you have to go full in. Like you can't, you can't just keep doing it part-time like you were when you had your day job or something. Like you have to like come up with a plan, come up with a schedule. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard for a lot, a lot of artists to abide by a schedule, but I feel like structure is actually a huge benefit to artists. Like, okay, if you're, you got to Like, there's so many different like personality tests online and all this kind of like, how, how am I like, as uh, you know, there's those, um, I can't remember what it's called, but there's like, you know, I, I'm like an empath, like, you know, a ENTI or whatever it is. Like you just, if you learn more about yourself, then you can almost like create a schedule around your strengths. So like, I'm more of a morning person. So like first thing in the morning, like I like to try and get up, I get my coffee and like get right to work with uh, like, I'll do some some emails at first I'll do a bit of like I'll flatten some caps and then get right into creation and then I know that like later on in the day like I have some lulls so I'll do some easier things then and I think yeah setting out a schedule when you do go full-time is is super important um it just yeah it almost like makes you more creative because you're like okay I've got a block on every like Wednesday at noon I want to be designing and you like kind of gear up for it. And it's like, okay, now I can design all my stuff. And then I know like by the, by the end of the week, if you're still in that like Monday to Friday grind kind of mentality, I know Friday I'm gonna be like less creative. So like, let's do more of the like emails and like just the tidying up and stuff like that. So that when Monday comes, I'm ready to go type thing. That kind of goes out the window when you are full-time as an artist like I literally forget what day it is every day because like I'm just excited to do this all the time you know I have to actually tell myself okay like it's okay to take a day off mm -hmm. uh so yeah <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah no I, I was a bit of a ramble but I hope there was something in no there. no for sure and it's, it's I'm glad you got into that because that's what I was going to ask you actually next was how do you structure your days now that you're a full-time artist? Because I've talked and interviewed people and artists before who have said they've had to go back to part-time because they've realized that they aren't structured or disciplined or weren't at that time disciplined enough to treat it kind of like a nine-to-five and have a plan. And they would realize that they weren't doing their work or being as productive or just as productive as they were when they were part-time. Because maybe they're like, oh, I can do art anytime. So I'll chill for a little bit. And then now it's 9 p.m. at night and now you want to work and you're, yeah. you are you just wasted a whole day. Um, so I'm really yeah. happy that you that you talked on that. I think it's easy to fall into those uh, bad habits, let's call them. Like I am guilty. Like some, some days I will wake up and all I want to do is just like have my coffee and like watch a bit of YouTube and, you know, just like chill for a bit. And then next thing I know it's noon and I'm like, oh, okay, well half the day's gone already. So I should probably get back to it. But I think, yeah, the structure thing is extremely important and like just being excited about what you're doing, you know, like um, the fact, like I, I constantly, re constantly remind myself like, okay, I was working at my other job. It was a pretty demanding job. So it was anywhere between like, 10 and 15 hour days, um, I would work for 11 days straight and then get three days off. So I, I will often think well, as I'm working on my artwork or a design or answering emails or just flattening bottle caps, like I could be super stressed out at like hour 12 in my day right now, but instead I'm at home in my studio and I get to do this thing that I love. So being excited about it, is super important too and i think that helps when when you do create a schedule for yourself you're like okay like what's the alternative like am i going to be making mm -hmm. coffees am i going to be pouring beers again like yeah. i'm making art this is awesome so keep that excitement when you go into your days and keep that schedule because you'll be so much more productive yeah for sure and um before we continue i wanted to go back to when you're talking about when you're working part-time and you're still creating art on the weekend. And like you said, a weekend warrior. Can you speak on how important that time was and the work you put in when you weren't even a full-time artist and how it prepared you to be the artist you are today and the full-time artist you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the weekend warrior 
gig is I think a lot of artists and just a lot of people in general have multiple jobs, like side gigs and stuff like that. Right. So there's only so many hours in a day. And so squeezing out that pr productivity is like super important. And if you can keep that like level of productivity up when you do transition into full-time art, uh, you'll, you'll be like unstoppable. It feels, uh, just because you just have so many more hours in the day to get things done. So it, it, what it does do though, is it helps you find efficiencies because you're like, okay, I already put in an eight hour day. Let's say I come home and like have a meal and I can put, you know, two or three hours into the artwork or on the weekend. It's like, okay, I have Saturday, Sunday off. So I still want to have a bit of downtime. So like, let's say I put in six hours on Saturday and like, you know, a couple hours on Sunday, first thing in the morning, and then take the rest of the day off. You find ways of being more efficient because you know, you have only that much time to work with. So it kind of forces you to be more efficient. And then when you do get into full time, that efficiency, if you can keep that, then you're just like, you're, you're a much more yeah efficient artist. Like art is a business. Let's, let's be honest you have to make money to survive. So you need to find efficiencies and you need to be productive. Like, but you also need to be creative too. So some downtime is important, but yeah, I think finding efficiencies is important being a weekend warrior. Yeah. I, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, and as a musician and artist myself, that's something that I have to also deal with and working that nine to five. And the hardest part about it, I would say is having the energy to, to do it after. Cause you can feel drained from your nine to five, but you have to realize that if this is something you want, you have to just do it. And motivation, I always really like to harp on do not wait for motivation because if you are not motivated and you're discouraged, then that means you're just not working on your stuff. You know, like motivation follows discipline. And I think the yeah. biggest part is finding out how to be disciplined and I think as artists sometimes it's hard for us because we have so many ideas that just throw us in a whole bunch of different ways so that means we're not mm -hmm. sticking on like one plan because now we have another creative idea like okay let's go down this path and all of a sudden you have all this in front of you and how can you really attack it and it might feel kind of discouraging when you're trying to attack it because you're not really moving the needle that much because there's so many things that you like have in front of you. So how are you able to kind of hone in on one specific goal and I guess set and achieve it? Well, my goal was to be consistently making art and I am very fortunate that my, my style and my medium is just like, very unique so i have quite a list of commissions like i'm working with probably about like a 10 month timeline right now so like that checked that box but i am i'm kind of struggling with trying to push my creativity uh in my own ways so i think journaling and like having a good like a good sketchbook and then an idea book um are things that really help me um you know when I do have those ideas, whether it be a sketch or just like a general idea for like a collection or something like that, that way I can go through and kind of every so often, like let's say maybe every couple months go through and, and pick the ones that I want to like really push forward and develop more, um, sort of prioritize them. Like, okay, I think, I think these ideas are the ones worth focusing on. These ideas that I had down here are like good, but these are better. So like, I'm going to focus on those. Um, so I think, yeah, just kind of like keeping a log and keeping, um, yeah, just like prioritizing lists of the things you do want to do, because as you said, as artists, we just always are like typically bombarded with these ideas and, oh yeah, I want to do that. I want to do that. But I mean, you're only one person and unless you can like hire someone or a group of people to do what you do and then like make them do it. Like that's next level, like Andy Warhol kind of stuff. So like not everyone's an Andy Warhol. Um, so if you're just one person and you want to do all these, these ideas, yeah, it's, it can be hard, uh, to just tackle everything, but yeah, I think, uh, keeping lists and prioritizing and then just like 
dedicating time. Um, like I, these, this list of commissions that I have, I'm trying to get to a point where I do like one or two commissions and then I focus on uh, a collection that I want to do or just a piece that I've been wanting to do for a while so that I do have, or I do keep pushing myself creatively and I'm not just trapped in this commission list, which is a gold, it is a golden ticket. Like I'm, these are in a way like golden handcuffs where I'm like, okay, I have all these commissions that I'm doing and it's, it's great that I get to do all of this, but like I, there's a big part of me that's like being pulled in another direction that I want to try different things. And, and then maybe once I can show that to the world, then I will be able to get to the point where I can make the things I want and people will buy them. Um, I think that's the end goal is just being that type of artist where everything I make will sell. <laughs> you know, that's what we want, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> hundred percent. I don't know if that answered your question. Or not. <laughs> no, no, it did. It did. It anyway. did. And I love when you are okay. just like, you know, keep talking and let your like, just get what you need to get out of, of your head. I think it's that's kind important of a too. stream of content. Yeah, exactly. Almost, you know, anyway, I'll try to be more. <laughs> no, you're point. fine. You're fine. We love it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'll get to a question in the audience. Namiria sure. asks, what inspires you the most as an artist? Uh, what inspires me the most as an artist? Uh, I'll I'll go a bit back to what I started with, and and uh, I too am a musician. Um, I used to teach piano. Uh, I was in bands, so like music is a big inspiration for me. Uh, anytime I'm creating a portrait of a musician that I love, I just do a deep dive into their whole collection. So. Um, like Kurt Cobain here just did a, a deep dive into all of Nirvana stuff. Uh, a really good one that I did recently was Prince and like, man, that guy goes way back. Like he was, he was around, you know, in the seventies and doing like crazy stuff. Like his, I think it was his first album. He's got like, it's almost like metal. He has like a few songs that are like metal. And I'm like, this is Prince. Like what is happening right now? Wow. And he's like, it's like early Prince where he's like, not wearing a shirt and like long <laughs> flowing hair and i'm like whoa like where did this metal come from like anyway so i think that that's a huge inspiration for me um another one is just literally like upcycling i'm mm -hmm. i'm a big proponent of you know taking things that would typically be thrown out and giving them a second purpose like i'm i'm always trying to find if there's something that's going to be thrown out like okay could i modify this to make it work is it like you know you know, salvageable kind of thing. So that's uh, a big part of my message too, is, is, is trying to uh, upcycle. So that, that's a big inspiration too, is, uh, is yeah, trying to give things a, a second chance, you know? Yeah, for sure. We definitely, Thank you for the question. Yeah, yeah. And we definitely love that over here in the garden, for sure, the, up, the upcycling. And I don't remember if you said it earlier, but can you tell them where you get your bottle caps from now? I think that's a good time to, to talk about that. Yeah, um, I still have friends that are in the industry bartending, uh, so they will save for me. Um, I've got a little bit of a presence online now, so people will come across my page and they have a cap collection. You know, it's one of those things where a lot of people start saving them for whatever reason. It's it's like almost like a nostalgic thing. You know, you can all, you can almost look back at your, you know, if you got a little jar or something and you go through, it, it's like, oh yeah, I remember that night we had the whatever beers and that happened. And this, this was a funny story associated with it. So it's, it's a weird nostalgic thing, but people sometimes will have an idea like, oh, I want to try one of those like bar top things or whatever. Like I have an idea to do uh, something with these caps and then they never get around to it because, you know, life happens and like, it's never at the top of anyone's list to like upcycle bottle caps into artwork, except, you know, maybe me and a few other people on the planet. Um, so yeah, they'll, they'll find me and just say, Hey, you know what? I have this cap collection. I thought I was going to do something with it. I don't really think I am. And I feel like you can put them to better use. So I'm getting a lot of donations uh, just from, from people all over North America, which is extremely uh, amazing that people are, are willing to just send me bottle caps. Uh, it's like, if you're a painter, you you know, you use oil paint and someone's like, you know what, I've been collecting all these oil paints for years, but I'm not going to paint. So do you want them? It's like, yeah, like that's my, that's my paint. So uh, yeah. people are sending me paint. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, and to get into the business side of things, 
A lot of times artists have trouble figuring out how to price their art. And some advice that they'll get is, well, you should look at this someone's art who is in the same me use the same medium as you, you know, uh, maybe the same size canvases, same style and see how much they're charging. And then you should, you know, base your experience and kind of put all those together when it comes to pricing. But when it comes to you, you obviously didn't have too many people to follow that model off of. So I guess this is a two part question. How do sure. you um, advise other up emerging artists to price their work? And how did you figure out for yourself how to price your work? Oh, yeah, that was that was a big struggle. Um, I think I've got it kind of dialed in now. And um, yeah, I, I think that's not that's not bad advice. Like, um, obviously, it was a different scenario for me because like I didn't know of anyone else that was doing it. So I just tried to come up with a bit of an equation like um, my, my materials were basically free other than, um, the panel that I create in the back. So it's a bit of plywood. So take all of your materials, uh, consumables that you use, uh, whether it be, you know, paint brushes, the paint itself, um, factor in your time. Um, basically I've, I've seen online too, where, um, you know, put a number on what you want to be making hourly. And then just with an equation, take take the the expenses and then uh factor in how much of that you're going to be using for one painting and then how much time it typically takes you to paint uh and then yeah throughout your time as the years go by and you get better at your craft and you're like finding your style your time becomes more valuable because you've invested that time through all those years so don't forget about that like if you've if you've been painting on the side for, you know, 10 years and you're really good at it and you feel like, okay, I found my style. I'm really good. I'm confident. Like you should bump up your hourly wage because the people that are buying those paintings aren't just paying for the, like, whatever it may be. Let's say it took you 10 hours to do this painting. They're not paying for that 10 hours. They're paying for the 10 years that came before that, where you were developing all your style to get to this point right so that's one thing that like really you got to remember like when i'm pricing now versus when i when i first started <laughs> so that first that first commission that i uh made for for uh my friend who opened the bar the joe strummer piece um i had no idea how to price it and i didn't think about any of that stuff and it literally came to um he gave me 400 dollars cash and a $400 bar tab at his bar. So I basically made $800 for this. Like it was bigger than this piece. Actually, it was, it was four feet by four feet. And it took me, like I said, two and a half months. So like $800 for like two and a half months, you know, in my spare time creating on weekends and nights, that didn't really make sense, but I did it because I didn't really know what to charge and so many artists i feel like fall into that trap and they like undervalue their work um so from then on when i when i was starting to get more like regular commissions roll in um i started to bump up my prices slowly uh i kind of came up with a bit of um an equation for like per square foot because my pieces are my smallest piece that i'll do for a portrait is three feet by four feet so 12 square feet so i i had an equation that would basically give me a good per square foot um price and then every like back in the day like uh from maybe about uh that first that first piece that i made for the bar was in 2014 so i'm, I'm coming on by like 10 years uh making solid commissions um, every like five commissions, I would bump up the price. But this last year, I've I've bumped up my prices uh, quite a bit because so many people keep saying yes. And it's like, okay, every three that say yes, I bump up my prices and don't be shy to bump them up like, you know, consistently because when you're making those pieces and your style is better and you're getting better each piece that you make, the value is also going up too so if people keep saying yes then keep bumping up your prices and i'm at the point where 
I'm getting like, you know, almost the, the same amount of no's as yes. So like, I'm, I feel like I'm reaching a bit of an equilibrium and like finding like my sweet spot, but, um, I think I can, I can still go up, uh, from here. So yeah, I know it's tricky. Um, but find something, an equation that you're comfortable with where it ends up paying you, uh, what you want hourly, like whether that be, you know, if you're starting out, like maybe $20 an hour is, I think, a good starting point uh, and then go up from there uh, as your as your technique and style and, and everything improve. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you're saying. I think one of the biggest takeaways I got from that was if you get a whole bunch of yeses, that means that you need to bump up your price. You're not. You, yeah, you're exactly. not pricing it high enough. Um, yeah. And I, I think a lot of people will use that uh who watch this because it is it is true if everyone is saying yes to it then it must mean it's not valued at the right price because like Mm -hmm. you said once you get that equilibrium you know okay the people who truly value my work are the ones who are willing to pay for it and the people who can't if they may they may value it but it may just not as much as the other people that are willing to spend you know and I, i i think that's uh really smart yeah. And I think the value thing too is psychological for a lot of people. So if, if you're, if you're making a piece and it's, you know, you're listing it for like a couple hundred bucks, like for a lot of people uh, in that, who are in a position to buy artwork and who are potentially art collectors or just art lovers, they see the price tag like 200 bucks and they're like, it, it's almost like a turnoff. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you bump up that price tag, like put it at like, you know, nine ninety five or something, uh, you know, people are, Oh, okay. Like this is like a, you know, a thousand dollar piece of art. Like, you know, they get a little bit more interested. It's weird psychologically how, how that, um, the price affects people. And, you know, now just the other day, like I talked to a client and I put out my price list and they didn't even, they didn't even bat an eye. They didn't even say like, ah, let me think about it. It was like, okay, $7,500. Boom. <laughs> And I was like, whoa, like that is uh, okay. So yeah. that's, that's where I'm at now. And, you know, you can get there too. It's just a matter of, uh, yeah, putting in all, all the things that we've talked about, mm-hmm. like the time, the dedication, like the efficiencies, all that stuff. If you keep doing that, those prices will come. Yeah. hundred percent. You got to keep with it. Yeah. And I, I yeah. guess like to go off of that, how did that feel um, knowing that someone was Amazing. willing to pay that much coming from where you first started where you were doing something for six years to complete one you didn't know if you were going to do this full time you were doing it while having like roommates and all that to like you now finishing that last piece giving someone the price um your price sheet and them saying yes to that number like yeah how, how did that make you feel in the journey that you've, you've gone through oh man like it is yeah, extremely satisfying when you when you get to put prices like that out and people say, "Yep, uh, you're I've seen your work." And you know, like it's not like I uh, had a conversation with them or anything. Even like some some clients, I I really like doing that where it's like, "Okay, what are you interested in?" Um, let's have a bit of like a video conversation, and I think that helps a lot too. This is probably a bit of a, a nugget of advice if you have someone coming at you being like, "Okay, I've seen what you can do," like. Um, I'd like to commission you to do something like reach out, like do make a video, you know, if it's someone in a different city, um, do a video chat and like, just get to know them. And, and a lot of the times when people are buying art, like it's the artist that they, you know, have a connection with, or, or there's like the, it's almost like the artist is like a bigger part of the sale than the art itself. Um, for some people, some people are just like, they see the art, they want it. They don't care who the artist is, if they're alive or dead or anything, but like a lot of people like that connection. And and when they're showing their friends, they're like, yeah, like I, I met this guy he's from Canada and like, he does this thing with bottle caps and like, then they, they, they have like a story to tell with the art. Mm-hmm. So you're giving them that too. Um, so don't be shy when it comes to like connecting yourself with a potential client because a lot of the times that's all they need to like say, okay, I, I, I've seen your art. I like it. I've met you now, or like, you know, video met you. And I think that was all I needed to like, go ahead with the, the, the purchase. So yeah, 
um, making that personal connection, I think is a big thing, especially nowadays. Like there's, there's an inordinate amount of art out there. So if they can meet the actual artist, then it's like, it's just that much better when they make that, that purchase. Yeah, for sure. That's a really, really good tip, honestly. Um, yeah, please, everyone who's listening, listening, please do that. Cause I feel like people are more willing to, to buy from you as well. Like you said, like once you have that connection with someone, it feels more personal and it, they feel more willing to, to spend that money. Cause if they like the connection they're getting with you, that's always going to be with them when they have the piece in front of them. So I think that's a, yeah, a great, great tip. And I, I know you being like a, the humble person you are, you wouldn't talk about one of your biggest pieces, or well, at least to me in my eyes, and where it is now. Um, and I think you know the one I'm talking about, uh, if you want to speak on that. <laughs> well, there's a couple. Are you talking about the Bulls? Piece? Yeah, the Bulls, the Bulls piece. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that was that was a fun one. That was my first um, like corporate piece, I guess you could, or like a corporate client. Um, I was I was at my lake, uh, turned off the cell phone, uh, just disconnected for a week. You know, part of that whole like disconnecting, walking away, letting your brain kind of refresh and recharge your creative juices. And I was coming back to. Uh, home and I turned on my phone and saw an email from the Chicago Bulls and I was like well that's kind of random like I've never been to a Bulls game I live like you know whatever it is like 2,000 miles away from Chicago like why is this a spam thing and I opened it up and hey this is so and so from uh, the Chicago Bulls marketing team Uh, we stumbled across your Instagram page and we love what you do we're just wondering if you could um, make us our logo we'd love to hang it in, in the stadium and i was like is this for real right now like i just had to pinch myself um i'm a, i love basketball too so the the fact that the bulls you know such an iconic organization uh, reached out to me was like you know a dream so yeah i worked with them and uh and uh made them a, a five foot by five foot piece and it's hanging in the, the offices at the united center as we speak so uh, that was a, a surreal experience. Um, and when you, going back to pricing, when you have these corporate clients, like it's safe to say that you could probably just double your baseline <laughs> price if you would for a yeah. regular, you know, just personal, uh, like private client kind of thing. Cause you know, there's often big money behind these organizations. So yeah, tip there is like, if, when you get a corporate client reach out to you, yeah, just like two X, three X your prices and, and <laughs> see what sure. they say. And yeah, again, they, like I probably could have gone higher than I did. This was like, yeah, my first big client. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I priced higher, but I think I could have like probably yeah. even gone higher than I did, but I'm happy with, with the whole experience. And, For sure. uh, yeah, it was a surreal experience. So yeah. Do you have times. pictures of it or do you know where I could find a picture of it? Uh, if you're on my website, go to commercial okay. uh, at the top. Yeah. And then that there's a blog ah, post about it. it. Okay. So yeah, the bottom one there. Yeah. All right. Awesome. I'm just going to show them that. And what advice do you have like for upcoming artists um, and that are trying to get into the business side of it? Because at the end of the day, art is a business. And sometimes as creatives, we don't like to admit that. But what? Yeah. What's some advice you have for emerging artists? Um. Yeah, I think I'll speak to that in two parts, like one in a creative sense and then one in a business sense. Um, Creatively, I think um, try and be aware of your surroundings because there's so much inspiration, uh, potential inspiration that's constantly just happening around you. So being like trying to be more like present and tapped into the things that are going on around you, you never know what's going to happen that could just spark you know, your, your life changing idea, Uh, like just saving these caps. It was just like a little, like, huh, I wonder, I wonder if I could do something. Like I've always been creative. As I mentioned, I was a musician. Um, I, you know, I've, I've got that creative mind, I guess. So just like being aware of your surroundings because creativity can be influenced by like anything around you. So like try and be present and tapped in. Uh, to to the regular everyday things around you because you never know what will literally change your life. And then from a business side, yeah, it is a business. And a lot of artists, you know, get kind of trapped in this 
like trope of I'm an artist. Like it just happens. It's like, no, like I would say probably like 50 or even 60% of my time is like doing the business side of things. Like nowadays, social media takes up a lot of time, you know, learning how to be efficient there where you're like, let's say making videos, like uh, batching your work so that you can use all of like maybe all the footage that you took and then create like several different, uh, you know, short form videos and then a long form video, stuff like that. I'm still struggling with like the long form stuff. It's just, you know, I'm trying to find more efficiencies there, but yeah, like the business side of things, staying organized, um, keeping tabs of like where people are from that are liking your work. Like I, I live in Canada, but most of my clients are from the U S so I sort of gear my stuff to American clients. Uh, and I'm starting to get a little bit of clientele in like Europe and one in Africa even. And so it's just like, okay, I got to start to think like marketing wise, like what works to like have a bigger reach to appeal to more people. Um, but yeah, no, staying, staying organized, staying on a schedule and treating it like a business. If you get reached out by a client, like the Chicago Bulls, like you got to be professional. You got to be ready to like pitch them. Um, this is what I do. This is why you should get my artwork. You know what I mean? Like I, I do it this way, which is way different than everyone else. And, uh, this is why, you know, I would love to make a piece for you, like making those connections. Right. Um, business is, uh, you know, art is a business. So yeah, treat it as such. Um, even if it's like a percentage, right? Like mm -hmm. Even if you put 20% of your, your time and effort into the business side, it's better than none at all. So I find that, yeah, it's, it's almost about like 50, 50 where I'm like half the time creating and like coming up with ideas and like actually like creating my pieces. And then the other half of the time is yeah. Emails and like, uh, just like doing my, like keeping my lists. Like I have, I have whiteboards and stuff where it has like my, list of clients and then other whiteboards that have like the ideas and stuff like that. And like redoing your website, making sure it looks good, doing all your social media. So it's, yeah, it's a balance, but like, it's kind of the only way to make it work these days. If you're a, a one person show, or if you have, you know, a spouse that can help you out with like the email side of things, then that's fantastic. So um, yeah, it's a business For sure. treat it as such. And yeah. um, one of the last questions I want to ask you is what was your biggest surprise uh, moving from a part-time artist to a full-time artist? Uh, I guess that could be in the sense of business, that can be in the sense of really anything, but what was like your biggest surprise? And then I guess um, kind of making people aware of that so they can, when they, when they make the transition, um, they'll be, you know, prepared for it. Oh, um, biggest surprise. Pro yeah, I, I'd say just, I guess the, the amount of, of response from people, um, you know, if, if I, if I'm meeting someone new and, you know, my friend is introducing me to like I, their friend who I've never met, they go, oh yeah, this is Jeff. And he's a, he's a bottle cap artist. Like people kind of look at me funny, like, oh, okay, this guy like does arts and crafts with <laughs> bottle caps. And then it's like, okay, like, let me just show you maybe a couple examples of what I do. And then it's like, oh, okay. The response. So like, I guess I've been doing it for a while. Uh, so like, this is kind of normal for me now, but I try and, uh, or I guess I, I forget that people you know, a lot of people haven't seen this type of work before. So when they see it, the surprise, uh, the response has been like overwhelmingly positive for me. And I'm extremely grateful uh, for, for every like comment that I get. That's just like, wow, like I've never seen anything like this. Amazing. I love it. Like I'm following you from now on. Um, I think like when I first started a year ago, full time, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and my first commission was like another big corporate commission as well. It's, it's, if you want to check it out, it's the yeah, Betty sure. vodka on my website there. Um, so that was a huge surprise, uh, to, to get like another, like massive client like that. Um, 
and then yeah things after that i had like so we're we're talking october 2022 um finished that up during that month and then november december i was like okay like i've heard you know moving up to the holidays this is when a lot of artists are selling most of their work and i had like a couple dry months where i didn't sell anything for like november december january i got one uh and then that one ended up going viral on TikTok, and then it just like the floodgates opened after that so it was like the surprise there was i didn't know what to expect like what is this is it going to be consistent is it going to come in waves is it going to be like what is it and so yeah it was it was a little disheartening to like finish this huge project for deep eddie vodka and then have nothing for two months it was like very like disheartening but i just decided to make a couple pieces um well i guess i made like three or four pieces during like november and december and then most of those have sold already this one is actually one of the ones that i made when I was in that lull and it still hasn't sold, but it seems to be the most like popular on my yeah. social media, but anyway, it'll sell eventually. Um, but yeah, then, uh, and then January on, it just sort of like really, really picked up. So yeah, it was surprising, uh, and very, um, nerve wracking mm -hmm. to not have that consistency when you're going from a day job that pays you every two weeks, uh, the same amount and it's regular and you can plan your life accordingly when you have two months of zero income. Yeah, it gets uh, it gets very nerve wracking. So um, luckily, I just kept with it and kept trying to promote on on social media. That's where I made the shift to like, really go hard on social media, like TikTok and Instagram specifically. And that's where most of my clients mm -hmm. came from after that. So yeah, yeah. And can you speak on the importance of social media as an artist and maybe your uh, pros and cons with it? It's a love hate, man. It's a love hate. Um, <laughs> yeah, I find like, when you're first starting out and you're really trying to push uh, push your stuff on on social media, like it it takes a while uh, to kind of figure out like your own formula. And I don't I don't feel like I've even yet figured out my own formula. What does work is you can like you know Instagram is like my main platform, and then everything I do there I just kind of like copy paste to like you know TikTok and Facebook and. Um, YouTube shorts and stuff like that. But just hopping on some of those trends is one of the easiest ways to start out. Like if you literally just, you you know, you follow your favorite artists and there's, you know, trending audio where it's like, you know, Hey, I'm an artist and like, I want to see this and that or whatever it is. You just take that audio, put your stuff in, um, be sure to get like good footage of uh, your process. People love seeing process videos where it's like, you know, oh, I'm working on the shading of his hair right now. Like, let me highlight that or like time lapses because my pieces, they take so long. Like they take anywhere between like probably 40 to 80 hours for my average size piece. So like time lapse is a big thing for me because it really shows like the piece coming together in a few short seconds where, you know, a few short seconds is a lot to ask from people these days, which is crazy wild that our attention spans are so short. But it's the world we live in, so you kind of have to play that game, I guess. Um, but yeah, social media is a, is a beast. It's a love-hate, like I said. But uh, if you just learn to love it uh, or just learn to just do it, uh, make it part of your day, um, then it, the, the numbers will come. Uh, and I've, I've seen that. Like I've had a pretty wild growth uh, from when, like a year ago, I think I had, maybe like 1500 followers on Instagram. Now I have close to 13,000 TikTok. I started a year ago. So I went from zero to like 30 something thousand on there. Um, and that's where most of my business comes from. So you put in the work and like the, the clients will come. Yeah. hundred percent agree. And speaking about social media, um, do you want to tag yourself, let them know where they can find you? Um, yeah, go ahead. Plug yourself. Yeah, you bet. Uh, Basically on everything, uh, like I mentioned, so uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube, at Jam Bottle Cap Art, J-A-M Bottle Cap Art. Um, 
J-A-M are my initials. And uh, some people just call me Jam now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll awesome. take it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for being a part of this interview um, and doing this live with me. I think a lot of people got a lot out of it and your unique so. style. Yeah, no, trust me. They definitely did. I was like watching in the the chat as well. And a lot of people just keep saying that's good advice. Like, wow, that's okay, amazing. Cool. And yeah, they seem to be enjoying it a lot. So I know more people when they go back and watch this are, are truly going to enjoy it again. So I just want to say awesome. thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to everyone watching as well. And we appreciate you all always um, sticking around and getting these advice because it's, uh, it's very important. And doesn't always come often uh, where you get to listen to people like Jeff. So thank you all. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And we will be back on Friday.